Let's toast to anarchy. <laughs> what, what happened to your drink? I drank it. <laughs> <laughs> to freedom. Freedom. <clears throat> Air shots. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. Freedom man. shots. That's yeah. my new uh, new uh, catchphrase for the day. Freedom shots. Free Welcome to episode eight of the Anarchy Roundtable. I am Joe. I am Mike. I'm Danny, and it's actually episode nine. It's not I'm episode Dave. Nine. <laughs> this is my first episode. This is episode one. What's your name, Dave? Dave. Okay. <laughs> who decides who is an anarchist or not? There's been a lot of stuff on Facebook lately, uh, within the last couple months, or all along, but a lot of times people say, well, you're, uh, that person's not a real anarchist. They're a fake anarchist, you know, because they, whatever. An anarchist is anybody who wants to end the state. Next topic. Well, no. <laughs> Well, there's no, there's a, <laughs> somebody once said, I think it was over here at my house one time, he, he, he identified himself as a philosophical anarchist. And that's basically what I am. I want anarchy, I believe in anarchy, but I, I don't care who you are unless you're living in a cave. I think I made that comment on Facebook today. Unless you're living in a cave in the woods somewhere, you're, you, you're in bed with the state in some way or another. We all pay taxes maybe as little as we can but you know we all pay taxes we drive on the roads an anarchist <laughs> doesn't mean somebody who is living in anarchy an anarchist is someone who wants anarchy well, who the fuck are you to define anarchy <laughs> are you like the president of the anarchists no, i'm not a president of anarchists <laughs> I'm, we're just, not, I'm just we're not language, language is an emergent order <laughs> And I didn't define it. That's just what it means. I know. I'm, I'm just messing yeah. with you. But there's been people that say because a person's involved with the Libertarian Party, even though they're identified as an anarchist and their platform is to abolish the government, somehow you're, you know, if you use that avenue to educate people or whatever, then that makes you not an anarchist or... If you, uh, there was another friend of ours that called out James and uh, another friend of ours saying that they're not anarchists because, what was it, they didn't, um, they didn't want to change the law about marijuana and, you know, so they're letting people, you know, this person actually says because they weren't supporting a political cause, they weren't true anarchists, which oh, seemed a little bit oxymoronish yeah, or whatever. But. oxymoronic to me, too. <laughs> they didn't want to change the marijuana law because there was a couple of different reasons, and I tend to agree with them. For one, the state wants $5,000 from everybody who sells marijuana under this proposal. And two, they wanted to keep the agorist market alive. Um, you mean the black market? Yeah. Yeah. They, they didn't want... The, go the, the government in on the game. The government would make so much money off of the um, the new marijuana law. Look at Colorado. Colorado has a budget surplus now because of the marijuana law there. All that's going to do is grow the state. Um, well, it depends on how you do Like, if you look at it. There's no one, no one's going to jail anymore for um, buying marijuana. Yeah. And so there's no. less, there, I would argue that there's less of a reason to uh, have uh, police enforcement in that specific regard. Right, but they have to dream up some other reason to have police enforcement, like people who have drones. You know what I mean? It's going to be endless. As long as they have money to cage people, they're going to come up with reasons to cage them. To protect them. And then they're going to cage them. So the less money that the state has, the smaller the state is. You can almost define the size of the state as the si how much money it has. And the marijuana law makes the state bigger by giving it more money. But if your state happens to basically be the uh, owners or main players in the world uh, monetary system, such as like the Federal Reserve notes, they can just print up money and... There's a limit to how much money they can print. They do not have an infinite supply of money. Technically, they do. No, they don't. 
Because well, just, every dollar they print reduces the value of every dollar out but there. But that doesn't change and, the fact that it technically can be infinite. Yeah, I mean, it's not an infinite supply of buying power. Let me put it that way. Sure, they could print a hundred trillion dollars, but then the dollars won't be any won't be worth much. They could they could print, and you could you could have a system where you have the dollar. And the dollar gets so inflated that you come up with new dollars. Yeah, it'd be like Zimbabwe. And that's what's been, been done in other com- countries. Yeah. Is they Mexico, come up with a new yeah. system and they start all over again. They came up with the old Deutsche Marks in the 20s. They got yeah. up into the billions to buy right. minor right. things. Yeah. And then they sold them and they tr- cashed them in for the new Deutsche Marks. Yeah. And it just starts to stay all over again. Right. And, and 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 technically, you do have the, the, the capacity to 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 keep going with the money. Yeah, you have the capacity to keep going. I'm just saying that the buying power of the state sure. is limited, and it's um, is it is it really? It is. Yeah, it absolutely it's, is. Limited. It is limited, but it's, it's limited. otherwise every state in the world would have just as much money as the United States, well, and they don't. Really, no, well, no, because we because they can they all can print money. No, I don't disagree, but the thing about the state is, and I learned this because I was highly interested in uh, warfare when I was younger, uh, the state is extremely good at marshalling resources Mm -hmm. and forcing, by the way, forcing its currency upon you. So if you live kind of, I would say, maybe like on an island and you have a state within the island uh, and it doesn't do any other trade, like in Russia or the communist states... uh, it can force as much currency down your throat as it wants, mm-hmm. and you will have to accept that currency uh, by a threat of yeah, violence. Yeah. Right. So, in theory, yes, they can do whatever they want to the currency, and you will have to accept it. You're like, you can accept it, but the, the, the buying power of the state is limited. But even, it doesn't matter, because the state's going to sit there and say, oh, we printed up trillions of dollars, you're going to accept these trillions of crappy dollars in exchange for whatever it is that you produce because you're in a closed off economy then you're going to not produce uh, that's what they did that's until what, they put a gun to that's your what, head that's what collapses um, communism, communism. Sure. I mean, it, it, but one of the things that you do have is like a, you had the, uh, the czarist state of Russia and it collapsed during World War I and it became the communist state the communist state in 1917, it lasted till when? 1989. 1992. 92, in that era there, when, when the Berlin Wall went down until the, until the actual changing of the... The dissolution. Of, 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 the, of the Soviet Union. Right. But each time, it rolled into something new. Yeah. It rolled from the czarist to the communist to what they have now, which is Who what? I would, I would argue what it's would kind you, of... Crony kind of capitalism. So it's a crony Probably. capitalistic pretty system. Much, pretty much every a, state on earth is uh, economic fascism today. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. But but just in the course of that particular country, they've gone through three dynamic changes from a monarchy to a communist mm-hmm. state, a, a tyrannical communist state that killed millions of people. Right. To a, to a state that is... Uh, Similar to what they, you know, similar to rules that they, you know, they have elections of some sort, whatever, but it just kept, it keeps going. If you're looking for the goal of changing the system and coming up with a, um, you know, a government free society, what do you got to do? What do you have to do? You have to convince a lot of people yeah. that government is not what, government doesn't solve your problems. So we got to rein this back a little bit. Yeah. So as um, he was, Mike was saying, is that who decides really fundamentally who is an anarchist and who is not? Um, I would argue anyone that imposes, uh, and the I would say this is particular to the ANCOMs, uh, who imposes this notion that uh, you must contribute to the greater good. That's what I would argue is... Well, we had, uh, what was that guy's name that was uh, at Liberty Fest two years ago? He was an ANCOM. He had some really good talk. Jacob Salt? Yeah. Jacob oh, Salt. God. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Is that well, who that well, was? He doesn't have any good arguments. 
Well, he, he, he had just some does good NBC stuff, but and he, he doesn't I, irritate you. He's an he's SJW and a feminist. Well, I that tells you a lot. Yeah, I I, I didn't realize that, who that that's who that was. But anyway, <laughs> when I asked him about that, I go, well, that's all well and good, but you know, or it, he claims that he's not for imposing that anybody, but it's just if as long as it's all voluntary, I don't really care what the hell. How you do. can you have a voluntary system where you have an administration that distributes goods and services to people like? The on system the basis won't of equality. Work. No, it doesn't. The, the system oh, it won't, won't work, work, but it. But as long as, but that's as, long what as it's voluntary, then who cares? The well, then theoretically, I voluntarily pay taxes. No, you I, don't. That's not what he's talking about. He's, no, you can't have voluntary we agree. With administration. If you guys own, decide to own this little area, say you know, um, ten miles by ten miles, and you say, okay, we are, and comes, and this is what we're gonna do, and. Do you want to, you know, as long as we can establish property rights? But that's the other thing. How how does that, there are people that are anarchists or say they're anarchists or whatever, but they don't believe in property rights. And I think most of my anarchist friends do believe in property rights, and I do. Well, the ANCOMs even argue that there's a distinction between uh, property rights and um no, um, private property and personal property. Yeah. And I think that's a really um, lazy, ha kind of half-assed argument. Basically, the notion is private property is anything you kind of use on a regular basis. Like this glass, this be yeah. pri or this is personal property. It's personal property as long as you're touching it. So does that make, it, make us communists because you're drinking out of my glass? <sighs> Fucking commie baby. <laughs> Next us mutualist asshole. Uh, <laughs> and we we just went full circle away from um, Dave's topic. You well, you, we had to rein it back a little bit. So. Yeah. All right. How do we get? A, um. Here, here's another way to put it. We have all of these um, these revolutions that happen, and it's out with the old boss. In with the new boss, same as the old boss um, kind of scenario. Same or similar. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it went from monarchy to democracy or monarchy to communism. Um, but they come up with ways to make a government that feels very similar to whatever was there before. And actually, the 20th century was really where the total state came to be. Um before the technology didn't exist to yeah, I mean, make the state what it can be I don't today. Know about that. Look I at think it was the 19th century. Yeah, yeah it could it have been the 19th started. century. Look, it no. may have started in the late 19th century. Look at the Roman but, Empire. Um, no. The Empire totally. was... The Roman Empire, if you lived in the country, you didn't have to pay taxes because the government didn't have the technology to collect them from you. Not much I'm, different I'm, than the U.S. They soldiers that um, would walk up on your land and say, this is now ours. They, they... It was not a total state. They could not control every little aspect of your life the way the government can today. Well, it's still the same way today. If you're in an outlying area, there's just... You still pay seven billion people still here, paying, so there's not. And with technology, the outlying there, areas don't really. There is no place in Michigan where you can get away with not paying property taxes um, without you having the government come and take your city, land. Like what is it, about ten, fifteen miles north of here? <laughs> yeah, the city where every three years the government comes and takes all their land and auctions it off to somebody else. Oh, well, that's true. But there's a lot of squatters and people that steal in electricity and don't pay their water bills. <laughs> it's it's in a, some ways anarchy. Yeah, there's some anarchical stuff in Detroit is what he's talking about. But, well, um, actually, there's a, a land. I watched this documentary a few years ago. Um, there's a little piece of, I don't know if it's Nevada or Arizona. Uh, I think it's California. No, it's not California. No. It's, it's one of the desert states. And um, uh, there's a really tiny... I don't know, maybe 10 square miles where there's two or three anarchist uh, associations. Yeah. And they, um, I wouldn't say that, well, there's, one is governed by like a young group of anarchists. The other one is more like these hippie anarchists. And there's one that's just kind of like. <clears throat> governed. 
They're not governed, but <laughs> what I mean is that they have... Their, governed in the David Friedman sense of governed. And there's the third group, yeah. which is really small. But the younger group, which is composed mostly of teenagers and 20-year-olds and alcoholics and drug heads, um, will tend to kind of war with the hippie ones. And they actually use... <laughs> it's interesting because they actually use uh, weaponry. And hippies have learned over time to... <laughs> start to defend themselves but there is a little piece of land where even the cops won't even bother to enter because they're afraid of um uh, being kind of run upon by these um anarchists i gotta i, I have to find a documentary all right so you found like 10 square miles in the entire continental united uh united well, there's States. a lot of inner city areas where, where the police are afraid to go yeah but i mean if we, I'm I'm talking about the difference between the state today versus like the 1700s. They they just could right. not control your life at all on the level that they do today. The, the number of laws that are on the books, the, the the way I mean, they control every little thing from you know the way everything that we have is designed. Like, you know, no, your know, carburetor but... has to be designed a certain specific way because the fascist state says it has to be. What's... The government is so omnipresent today, and that's what I mean by the total state. What's really scary is what's coming next. <laughs> that's what's scary because they just keep getting stronger. Well, I, I think, think they're it... getting faster. They're getting faster, not getting stronger. Mm. The responses are more getting immediate, more, but I think what I'm more oppressive, more power. What I'm hopeful is that, um, and mind you, I, I I don't advocate a violent revolution at all. What I my perception is, I mean, I can see how I can I I can empathize how some people like James might want that. I don't think it's a healthy path because eventually, I think violence begets violence. So. My focus, and I, this is why I tend to agree with Katie, is try and spread the message in an empathetic way and appeal to people's, I know it sounds kind of manipulative, appeal to people's psych, psychology. Because yeah. The thing about the state, it seems to me, and it's the same thing with religion, is there's this belief that I can't control myself, and therefore I need this super entity Turn that down. to... Um, control me and my neighbors because I'm sure they can't govern themselves it's that mentality that needs to be destroyed yeah what was that uh, I think it was that article that I posted earlier uh, people want to use government to, to rule over other people <laughs> that was Danny by the way asking about my job everyone wants to I honestly think, I think at some level everyone kind of wants to have power. I really do. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you own your own business, you want to have the money, the luxury that comes with, like... Well, money and luxury is different than no, but you power also, over other people. There's two kinds of power. There's, like, personal power over your own life. Sort of. And but the if ability you to acquire... People. And then there's power over others. Well, money is but power. But if you, if you employ people... Do you not have power over them? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it... I, look, they can leave the, the relationship whenever they want. But... I just had this memory from back when I was in the Air Force. We had these... Um, we, I lived in the dorms. And we had these um, dorm... I forget what they called them. But basically... A barracks? Yeah, yeah, barracks. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had these people in the dorms who had the keys to everybody's room in case you um, lost your keys or whatever. And they had they gave them like a title, a dorm something or other. Um, I know you're I know what you're referring to. I can't think of the title. Yes, yes. Yeah, basically like an RA for um, college, but it was for the military. Um, but they didn't really have as near, even as much power as an RA. Um, they were basically just people with keys. And one of them was like, I've got keys, I've got power. <laughs> <laughs> Respect my authority. <laughs> and, and he probably almost felt that way, actually. He probably felt pretty good about having those keys. And I think 
cops get off on that too. I think oh, that, yeah. I mean that's you Power know is intoxicating. You become a cop and really all a cop is is like this implementer of what other people do. They have Almost no power at all. <laughs> That's bullshit. In, in the end of the day, the individual cop, because all they can do is what the government tells them to do. Not really. No. And they have a huge amount of leeway. They can yeah, I guess make or right. break you, and they can lie, which they often do. And uh, Yeah. But power yeah. corrupts, and ultimate power corrupts ultimately. It also attracts the corrupt. Well, yeah. I don't know if it corrupt. If, here's the thing. Everyone, as far as I can tell, is corrupt. Everyone lies. We don't necessarily all lie at the same time. We don't all lie at all the time, but we do lie, and we do have um, personal deficiencies. Oh, come on, Joe. Bullshit. That was him. <laughs> yeah, because you're just shaking your head. <laughs> all right, so, but, um, like I said before, and I agree with Mike, power does kind of attract, or... It does attract a sense It corrupts. Of, it I, does both. I don't, I don't know if it corrupts. I like, think it does both. Oh, it does Would both. Would you say a businessman that wants to get rich is corrupt? No. Why? No, there's nothing wrong with wanting to get rich. Not necessarily. There's nothing yeah. necessarily wrong with rich, getting rich. If you, okay, let's, let's, let's look at a weapons manufacturer, all mm-hmm. right? All right. So let's say the CEO of Boeing or um, Boeing. Defense, Boeing Defense or whatever, um, they build weaponry for the government. Mm-hmm. Fine. Um, their, their main contractor is the government. So is it bad that they build weaponry for the government if their goal is to achieve a lifestyle that they envision? Now, mind you, they aren't forcing employees to, like... You're, you're kind of separating... That's a great area. You're, you're kind of separating the goal to get rich from what it is that they're doing. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get rich, but if you're going to do unscrupulous things to accomplish it, What's then, unscrupulous then there could be weapons? something wrong with that. Um, you're selling weapons to a no, see, this corrupt is the problem. government. You're, 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 you're basing this on the client versus the actual action of providing weaponry. If if they were to provide weaponry to like a private military force, would you have that same contention? No. So no, I mean, it depends it on, on the client. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, if if your client is known to be an emperor, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and you provide weapons to them. Um, you're participating in the well, empire. Well, you but can make I guess that same on the argument. other hand, if, if everybody's participating in the empire because the empire is omnipresent. But Joe, so, by your same reasoning, if I find like, I participate in the empire because part of my paycheck is paid for by rent from one of these people that you're talking about. But Joe, by that same reasoning, if I am, if I'm Remington and I made a make a bolt action rifle and I sell it to someone mm-hmm. who is a rapist or a murderer and they go out and commit murder 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 hide your yeah. hide with, your kids and weapon, hide your wife because the the weapon, the every, everybody's getting murdered up in here <laughs> how do you spell it uh, I'm going to go with M-U-R-P-E-R okay I'll look that okay. up after you <laughs> put that in the show notes please yeah everybody's getting murdered up in here <laughs> but if if I sell that weapon to someone yeah. who has ill intent mm-hmm a murderer <laughs> uh, to commit violence against other people, then what you're saying is, by extension, I am implicit in that. D- do you know my, that that's what they're going to do with it? I think. Well, the I don't problem, know if the federal government necessarily is going to use my particular missile. Do I? I, I think more of the problem with, uh, you know, defense contractor. It's more uh, the way they're in bed with the state. You know that they're selling their weapons. For stolen money, that it's a basically we're living in a fascist system where the government and the corporations kind of like make the laws and basically rule us. So, and we have all these immoral wars. So it's well, I think they're just so convoluted that it. I think they are evil, but 
I think your point is very valid. And uh, well, let me ask a more specific, let me ask a more general question. And I, I've brought this up before, and uh, I've never really got a strong response out of it. Um, okay, assuming there's a state, and assuming there are these businesses, and let's not say corporations. I, I really don't care. It's a business, well, right? Because my business. Anyways, what I what I do, but it's a ima- small business. But imagine for a second that the state exists, and you see the state as being this power entity, and you want to ensure your survival as a company. Um, is it not within your interest to use the state? I mean, is that immoral <laughs> to take that position? Um, All businesses have to, in order to work in the in the in the above uh, above board uh, economy, they have to comply with the rules of the state in right. order to work here. But they have to pay. Income taxes on their employees. They have to pay taxes on the the, the equipment that they buy. But that's and all stuff like that. But, but they do do that. They have to comply with the state in order to be a, an, a lawful business. But what I'm asking is, if these businesses have an, it seems to me the businesses have an automatic incentive, and I would argue most people do too. Uh, to if they can see the state as beneficial. In the long haul, yes, they will. They may have to pay up the ass for it, but if it means that the continuation of the business goes on indefinitely, so you, say, you mean make the state a customer? Not make the not state so, a customer. But lobby, use laws to yeah, right. protect. Oh, their use the interests. state. So this comes to the Molinulian point. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know you hate Molinulian. Molinulian. No, no, I mean this is from before he jumped the shark. Okay. Um, so this is actually stuff that I agree with. He made this statement, and there's a lot of meaning behind this statement that I agree with. Um, and the statement is this. There are no moral choices in an environment of coercion. If, you know, if you think about what, what, he's, what he's getting at here is, let, let's go to a bank. A bank is a perfect example. Um, it's pretty immoral to run a bank today because in order to run a bank, you have to really get in bed with the government or your yeah. bank isn't going anywhere. Um, and if, and the government is always trying to come up with new rules and ways to control your bank and it's going to potentially make it very difficult for you to run your bank. So then you have to have lobbyists to try to control the government before it controls you. And if, as long as you have lobbyists, you're going to want to try and make your bank as profitable as possible. Um, and you have to participate in whatever government program, whatever, however the system is, is set up. Like if the system requires that you buy U.S. treasuries with... Um, um, so banking is an immoral business. So banking is an immoral business because you have to be in bed with the government to be in banking. Well, on no, the no. other hand, there's a whole other side to this. If you were to close all of your banks, it would be horrible for the people. The banking is a much needed um, function function of any uh, modern economy. So, we, I mean, do you have a bank account? You have a bank account? You have a bank account? I have a bank account. A good analogy we all have bank would accounts. be like. Uh... Um, we get loans from banks. Um, we um, have, we put our money there. They they they. Do our transactions? They they're, they're much needed functions of society. It would not be moral to just close all of the banks. So there is no moral choice when it comes to banks. Well, you can't close them and you can't keep them open. Both choices are immoral, and it's the result of being in an environment of coercion. So then the question is, what is the most moral thing to do? And I think. You can kind of look to, would this service, would this business exist in a free environment? And I think if the answer to that is yes, then there's certainly nothing wrong with going in that business. Well, technically, you can make an mm-hmm. argument that the state would exist but, in a free environment. And yeah. I, no, what I mean by that is it's services. Well, there are a lot of services. Like, I would see nothing wrong with being a firefighter. If you want to be a firefighter um, and help people 
you know, rescue people from fires and put yeah, out yeah, yeah. houses and all this stuff. There's nothing wrong with going to get a job for the state as a firefighter because for the most part, that's the only way you're going to be a firefighter in your you know, neighborhood. When I was in uh, Charleston, uh, they have badges on the houses, the older houses, is for uh, fire insurance. And basically, if you have that badge, you are part of the fire insurance. But yeah. your uh, example reminded me of something I've given some thought to in the past is what if you were um, born into a, a, a slave-owning family? Oh, wow, yeah. That's, that's and cool. say you own 100 slaves in a plantation, but you have um, whatever prices were, a million dollars loan on your plantation, you have money... So you can't, you can't just free your slaves. You don't have the money to free them. You know what I mean? So you can't just say, "This is immoral. I'm going to free all my slaves." But you don't have the money to do that. So what you said is, you have a loan on your slaves. You have a loan on your plantation or whatever. Just say yeah. you don't have the money to just free them. You have contracts that say whatever. Yeah, that you have to keep these slaves in a sense. But so how do you? And this is a reality of yeah. something I've I've you know read about I, I can't give you any examples but this is a reality how how does a moral person you know i think it might have been jefferson or and some yeah, other jefferson. stuff that i read that made me think about this that i'm not sure but it seemed like he couldn't really afford to just free his slaves he couldn't but, afford to free them and actually what happened to jefferson slaves is worse than but that's any how, others. how is that different than your bank example you know what i'm yeah. born into this system it's an evil system uh you know, I don't. I want to. F I don't. I think it's wrong and immoral to do this, but mm. I, I don't have the power to free them, even though I own them. So, isn't it better for me to just treat them better than other people, and still be a slave owner? How How do you reconcile that? With, I, I think. I guess Molino's point is correct. It's yeah. There's no moral. There's no moral choice because if if you just close your business then your slave in that situation the bank is going to take your slaves and it's going to be the worst thing that ever happened to them which is what happened to um uh jefferson slaves they all got sold off and this is before the internet the telephone and they weren't even allowed to write letters all of their kin they were separated from for the rest of their lives and they never got to have another word with them again um they would have been far better off to stay slaves so probably the the most moral choice you could make as a slave owner in that situation would be to run the most efficient business you can and get it out of debt and then free the slaves after but, you have uh, the power to free them. Because at the, at the earlier point, do you, you don't have the power to free them. You how do you reconcile that with someone like me, or I don't know how Lysander Spooner would have felt, but I think that it would have... It, the moral thing to do as a slave, I think it was completely moral if you were a slave to, to kill your your masters. I think that was the absolutely moral. Yeah, I could see you that. You had an absolutely moral right to kill people. Now, how do you reconcile that with somebody who's, uh, I'm trying to help you out here. You know, it's kind of like the government, too. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, I don't know. The government is so intertwined with us that there is no way to not be in bed with the government. And right, like I got in bed with government with my job, and I didn't even know when I took the job. But because it's, it's so omnipresent, so much more pervasive than that. It's yeah. You know, if you're like I said, even if you're driving down the roads, it's such a cliche. But I mean, if you're paying taxes, does that? Does that make you, you know, a murderer? Because you're, you know, you're you're paying to you know commit I've, drone strikes or bomb. Yeah, you know, I've kind of been having a little bit of trouble with this one lately. Um, as far as being an American citizen, um, I'm almost starting to feel a little bit Guilty. like it's immoral to be an American citizen and continue to pay into the most. Um, the, the, the greatest empire that's ever existed in humanity that has 20 million dead since World War II and has subjugated entire country, several countries around the world. Um, it, it, almost, its own people. it almost feels to me like maybe the moral thing to do as an American citizen is to leave. 
I've actually thought about this earlier today. Um, I was actually thinking... Um, now, most countries and most governing bodies would not consider the United States as tyrannical. However, given that we live inside of it and we see it on a daily basis and it consumes roughly anywhere between 30 to half of what we make, um, I would consider that tyrannical. I thought to myself, what if I had uh, appealed, like went to Singapore and then asked for amnesty? Oh, the guy just did this with Canada. Really? There was a guy who went to Canada and um, applied for asylum because of police violence. And he had all these warrants out from him for him for like trivial stuff like jaywalking and stuff like that. And um, Canada Denied deported, him. Him, yeah. deported him to the United States. So I, I shared the, the article on it, and I put in my little title above what I shared, um, if you don't like it, why don't you leave? Because here's a guy who tried to leave the United States, and he couldn't. And then one of the last things in the article was, he's like, he, I hate America. And here's a guy who hates America. He tried to get out. Couldn't do it. But back in the day, during the Vietnam War, uh, conscientious objectors and, and people that were opposed to the war and, and uh, were drafted and whatever, they went to Canada and they were yeah. granted asylum. Yeah. And they weren't deported. Yeah. So what has changed in the well in it, the poor in the forty well, years? It's a slightly different situation. Imagine the news article that would come out if Canada granted someone asylum because America is tyrannical and violent. That would make waves around well, the world. Well, <laughs> well the, look, the same thing happened then, though. Okay. This was this was you know you, the guy the people were legitimately drafted by the by the draft law yeah. by the by the the lottery and whatever it was at any particular time in the in the in the sixties in the in the early seventies and the people that were who left the country and went to live in Canada were not deported by Canada. They were not. Extradited, they were not sent back. Yeah, well, and and, and what has happened? And, and that was a breaking the law. That was a, that was a federal law. Yeah, that you were you were breaking if you were doing that. You were evading the draft. Canada weren't they involved in the Vietnam War? Or were Absolutely they not? not. Well, okay. well, that they, could be they a, big a little thing bit to do a with little it. bit, but 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 they they it wasn't. I really don't think they were very very much involved at all. Not no, but, not but, but draft draft. Evaders went to Canada, yeah. and they, and, and what you're saying now, it, has it changed in the 40 years since then? Has it changed that that that, that the United States has so much power over uh, Canada influence. that Canada does not want to make way? The first thing with, that popped into my mind that's what, was that's what that's was what, this yeah. before or after the Canadian dollar went down? <laughs> no, this is really recently. So that's the what Canadian I say, dollar the dollar is down. Is, you know, it, they, sounds they, like a, it sounds like their power is a little bit lower. <laughs> it, 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 you'd have to investigate their whole situation to see where they stand on the thing. But uh, I just wonder if, it, if they have a different outlook well, Dave, on that. I love I, what you brought up and uh, Joe uh, quickly said. I think it's interesting that um, Russia is telling the United States you're being tyrannical. Yeah. And not only that, Russia took asylum of um, Snowden. 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 Ooh. Whoa. Ooh. Calamity on the set. <laughs> We're having technological um, <laughs> deficiencies, to borrow a phrase oh. from Idiocracy. Yeah, it's, that God <laughs> it's the one with the goddamn tape, isn't it? <laughs> the duct tape. <laughs> it's not regular duct tape. It's not regulated duct tape is it's what it is. Tape. Oh, that's even more. Gorilla is a duct tape. There you go. Oh, it wasn't on anyway. I say we keep that just because it's humorous as shit. It means we're all faulty. Hey, uh, <laughs> Joe, Joe, you might want to check that. Before the camera fell, you were, you were saying, um... What were you saying about Russia? They had uh, Snowden in there. They're yes. saying the United States Ru is Russia's, tyrannical. Yeah, Russia's warning us on socialism and communism. Mm -hmm. They were, uh, right before Obamacare passed, Putin was kind of saying, hey, 
uh, United States, don't experiment with this too much because it was kind of a disaster for us. <laughs> so when you have yeah. the most vile, technically the most tyrannical, to totalitarian governments, formerly, right. telling you, hey, don't go down this path, it, it really doesn't work. Um, and then we proceeded down it, and I just said, I don't say we, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. I think it's a valid thing to say we, because we, we, yeah, because he's we're actually talking to the this people government. too. But I, I, I sit there kind of like, that's a huge warning sign from yeah. something that became a failed state and is still struggling 30 years after it failed. I'm a you little know, confused I'm, I'm not, about Russia. I'm not like a big you. fan of, of objectivism that much, but there are some... Oh, bullshit. What? You're a pretty rational, realist, you know... No, I mean, she's not an anarchist. Who? Oh, Jesus Christ, who, who, Joe. Whatever. Who, who, I don't believe... Not an anarchist. I'm an atheist, and I just said Jesus Christ, but... Who's <laughs> Ayn Rand? Who's Ayn Rand. I, I mean, what, but, whatever. The point is... Let's not get lost in this. Let me just make the point. Um... Ayn Rand from Russia comes here and writes one of the, the most famous novels of the 20th century, warning Americans of socialism. And I would say that Ayn Rand brought more people to this movement to anarchy than anyone else, even more than Rand Paul. I would say that more people, not Rand Paul, well, good. Ron, Ron, Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. But I would say that if there's one I, more than um, to the libertarian movement. Let's be careful here. To the libertarian movement. To, well, the libertarian movement is the seed to, to, to anarchists, really. Anarchy is part of the libertarian movement. I mean, yeah. anarchists are libertarians. Yeah, if you follow Marx, libertarian but, but, ideas yeah, all if, the way to its conclusion, you get to anarchy. But by the same extension, Marx, and while his arguments are invalid, he advocated that under communism, the state would dissolve. He was an anarchist of sorts, I guess. Mm, but I, but I look, I don't, I don't necessarily like his reasoning. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying that's what he advocated, and he yeah, was. Yeah, he was an ancom. And there, there was, you go, ancom. He was very popular <laughs> in terms, like when I think of Marx versus Rand, um, Marx is much more popular than Anne Rand in totality. I think Ayn Rand makes a lot more sense. No, I agree. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, she's not perfect. Nobody's perfect. That's okay. that's the whole I'm point about my original to topic is who decides who are the real anarchists, you know? Well, Ayn Rand decided she wasn't. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask exactly. You. But <laughs> my, my. I, I've made, I, literally like 20 years ago, I made a, a logical decision that I'm not an anarchist because probably even had something to do with Ayn Rand. But, I mean, I... I rejected anarchy, and you know it was just a couple of years ago that I accepted it. anarchy as my savior. <laughs> <laughs> I saw well, you looking up. I wondered where you were going. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious about this because <laughs> the wording here says yeah. who decides who is. And yeah. Let me ask you: Why does it have to be a who, and why do they have to decide? Oh, Who is a real anarchist? There's the question. <laughs> but well, I'm I'm being a little. Uh, I, I I was really didn't know how to word that. It looks but, like you want a governing body based yeah. on no, that. No, I'm being sarcastic. The governing body of the anarchist. I am being sarcastic. Don't there. there. I am being sarcastic. I, I was trying not to name names. Uh -huh. But <laughs> I certainly have thought of his name more than once tonight. But. I was trying to be sarcastic as to who decides, because it's bullshit to say that Joe, that's why I, 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 right, I right. fuck well, with Joe an already. Anarchist. You're not an anarchist? Oh, that's right. You decided. I'm sorry. You're, you're deciding oh. this? Well, I mean, I was. Who so are you I was self-appointed. Is, 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 <laughs> is this an important question to ask? Fair enough. In that, that uh, the first time that I ever thought, I personally ever doubted Government. Government. The faith of government. You know, the blind faith in the uh, I think we have goodness to, of American government. government. I think we have to kneel and face Washington it's, when um, we say the word government. Gonna, <laughs> it's, 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 it's basically during the Vietnam War. Oh, wow. When I realized that that they weren't being 100% truthful in what we were doing over there. And eventually, you know, we, you know, we left. And I, and, and uh, from that time in the late 60s till till now it's taken me 
almost within the last three or four years to become what I would consider an anarchist. So, who the fuck are you to consider yourself an anarchist? <laughs> I already, I already well, established, I I already established I, my I, own I governing I body on this. this. <laughs> but, but, I don't want to make a but I'm sorry. <laughs> but deciding on who is, and it, it, it's a journey. And where exactly. the, person, I agree where the person is on that journey and how long that journey is, is, is. It could be 20 years or 30 20 years, years. It could like be 30 years. 20 years for me, 30 years for so you. So trying to be all inclusive. I'm much younger than everyone. And, 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 yeah. and, and getting people that We've are just that barely starting in, on the journey and having them. He was the actually fold. a true anarchist while we were still on a journey. You know, this is this, this, himself thing. and everything. This, this, um, this brings up a little minor topic that I wanted to, to, to bring up. Why um, are we talking about minors? How, how old are you, Dave? <laughs> I'm 63. And Mike? 30. Yeah. 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 Oh. Shut up. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 shut up. Uh, Mike's younger than me. I'm younger than him and older you, than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. Mr. Uh, this, seriously, come on. I don't want to talk about All it. Right. He's, he's so girl. old, he doesn't even want to talk about it. And I'm 39, and you're... 29. 29. I'm 39 also. Um, <laughs> like Jack Benny. I still remember the, the anarch- <laughs> Come on. So, the, anyway, I'm just saying the anarchy movement spans generations. This yeah. isn't, um, you Murray know, Rothbard's parents met at an anarchist ball. Yeah, that's true. What? Um, Serious. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like something that you start out as, as a kid, like you're a rebellious kid and you're an anarchist and then you grow out of it. I think people grow into it as they get older. It, I think it might even be right. the other way right. around. I think there might be more older Anarchists, at least at least in their forties and thirties, well, I would and argue in their twenties. I would argue um, that any primitive animal, particularly mammals, are all anarchists. I don't know. And, uh, you don't know much about primates. There are there are arguments that that, <laughs> Alpha that, that male. so many things in your life are based on a on a non course of you know. Oh, yeah. That's like. That that so many things have no rules and, and just are just free to choose. Yeah, everything that works. Everything that works is that once you get people to realize that this is the way things work and this is the voluntary system that works, that you could get them to see that the coercive system of the government doesn't work. And it, and it doesn't work universally. You know, that's part of my path to discovering anarchy, actually, was through economics. And if you study free market economics, like like I came up through, like, Milton Friedman and all that. Yeah. Milton Friedman's thing was, literally, he had this series in 1980 called Free to Choose. He spent 20 hours on PBS talking about one thing after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, that's better that the government doesn't do. Yep. It works better if the government doesn't do all of these huge lists of things that he spent 20 hours spelling out. It wasn't that much of a leap to say, well, what if they don't do defense and police and courts? You know, it, it's, it's just one step further to get from minarchy to anarchy. I have a, but Milton Friedman, Friedman, what did he? He did some really dickish things. Well, know. he he came up with uh, didn't yeah. he come up with uh, Chicago school. paying income tax after withholding, or withholding. withholding tax? He came, he came up, up with, with withholding, withholding, withholding tax. Yes, right. which so, he regretted it. He so said he wait was a minute, sorry. Milton Friedman is not an anarchist. <laughs> no, he, right? no, he he wasn't <laughs> he an anarchist. Was, he never no, claimed to be. But, he was a minarchist, and but he was he was seeing you know how to do things effectively through economics and he came up with a way of how to make government more effective my point is that his uh, son is actually the person who introduced me to anarchy david friedman your son Uh, is david friedman no 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 friedman's son son. but what what i'm saying is hmm? you actually met him is i and rand okay okay. i and rand brought so much to 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 our way of thinking milton friedman brought Milton Friedman brought so much to our way of thinking. If not for Milton Friedman, I might not be an anarchist. Even so what I'm wasn't. saying is that Milton Friedman is not an anarchist. Yeah. And 
Joe's not an anarchist, according to this gentleman. No, I'm, I'm just screw joking. That gentleman. But <laughs> what I'm saying is, who are we to judge? And even if that person is a minarchist or, or is not all the way there, doesn't mean they don't have a lot of value to add to our intellectual journey. Journey. Oh, I would definitely recommend the, the series free to choose. Yeah. To anyone who. Um, it's dated, Bill. It's it's. <laughs> it's dated. It's but dated. Still, it's, it's it's dated and no, it's it looks it, look, it's it looks good. like it was recorded in like three sixty p. Um, no, they didn't have it's like forty p. It's, well, it's really primitive. <laughs> it, it's primitive, even though four eighty p was the but standard. But there's, a, there's, a, there's um, an accompanying book that he wrote. I have. Yeah, this book. there is an accompanying yeah. book. Who um, wrote that? Milton Friedman. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, but Free to Choose is an excellent series to introduce people right. to all of the things that could be done better without the government. And he he very he does a very he, good job of spread. articulating that. And, ooh, you're not. It's not that much further to get from Free to Choose to being an anarchist, really. I mean, no, why was, would you burp? Because <laughs> you gave me beer. Oh, okay. Let me. I, I have a kind of a question. This is, uh, Here's a kind of a question. Let's, let's it, it's listen. deviating, and I, I've heard the deviant question. De deviant. Okay, question. so I've heard the argument from a lot of sadists. Well, without the government, there would be no internet. Sadists. Now, no, no, no. now mm. here, this is what I. Fu no, now, let me. You got to Let me get a, further into this. Yes. Um, I do wonder at times, and I wonder if there's any validity to my thought. That some of the things that the state comes up with as solutions, um, maybe the market was too slow to recognize. Firefighting. Mm, the market was... That, what, what happens is the market comes up with something and people realize it's a really good thing to have. And so then they get the force of government behind it to force it on everybody. <laughs> And that's, I mean, that's kind of what happened with, with fire. So I'm kind of wondering, yeah. does, can or does a government possibly drive uh, innovation? It can possibly drive some innovation, sure. A, but I would say on net, I mean, I would say the government absolutely drives mm -hmm. some innovation. Well, but look, you have to net it out. And when you net it out, the amount of innovation that ha would happen in the absence of government is far and above. Not necessarily. Way, no, way no, above no, no, what no, no. you would have with no, the no. government. No, but there's, there's, there's a problem with that argument because if you look at, for example, uh, how the private market was treating um, uh, nuclear technology mm -hmm. uh, versus when the government came in and said, Let's build a bomb. Well, that's my and that and that's the thing. It's it, I sit there kind of like, would the private market really be interested in theoretical physics and invest enough money? There was into... nothing theoretical about that. That was it, the... no. The, uh, the atomic bomb was theoretical in 1910. We only developed it in 1940. But I'm just saying it wasn't it wasn't a theoretical reason. That, that was the greatest. Probably, except for maybe the last 10, 20 years, that was World War II was probably the greatest period of, you know, innovation, human innovation. And it was driven by government and war. Yeah. And like Hitler's 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 eugenics actually revealed a lot of um, understanding genetics, that was understanding our, you, the, the United genome. States genetics. Well, no, but Hitler really like his whole racial agenda it really did push medicine, and I maybe it wasn't well, the I'm best way, but there was there is differences between blacks and whites. There's differences between Hispanics and whites. There's these genetic differences that weren't really understood very well it, until Hitler came along and said, "All right, there are differences. Now let's put the war machine behind it and see why there is that." Mm. And I kind of sit there, like, well. I'm not familiar with the differences too much, but... One, one thing on this topic, Tom Woods did a show specifically covering how the Internet would have been invented absent the government, and uh, he, he, he went well into this topic. Um, it absolutely would have been invented 
Um, oh, I don't disagree. It would have been, but I, I do wonder at what timeline it would have been. It, it was, you know, it would have um, been very similar. A lot of things, we talked about this before. Um, like with the airplane, how it was invented in France at the same time that the Wright brothers invented it. And a lot of technologies, yeah, and you said Brazil as well, and that, and that I remember. Um, a lot of technologies just have a time when they come to be, and sometimes the ju- the government jumps on. Look, the government has forty percent to fifty percent, depending on which country you're in. Some some of them maybe even sixty percent, or if you're in the Soviet Union, a hundred percent of the economic output of the, the economy, the resources, and if the government is putting money towards R&D, then some of that money is going to lead to things that get invented. That doesn't mean that if the government hadn't stolen 40, 50, or 100% of the economic output of society, that that money couldn't have also been directed to exactly the well, same okay, thing. Or something me, else. Yeah, or something else. What is it that didn't get invented because, because yes. we went to the because people went to the moon. Yes, unknown well, costs, and I, yeah. I I don't disagree with the you. The seen but, and the unseen. But I would I would I do think it's interesting that you bring that up because I do wonder, um, would the private market have sat there and said, "All right, it's 1950, let's go to the moon." No. And I don't think that they would. No, but, would, we, we might probably still have never been to the moon. And at this point. I kind and that's the thing is I said they're like well. It seems until it becomes very profitable or at least economically so, attractive. Yeah. And I kind and mind you, I understand that going to space really doesn't have a lot of value right now. I mean, yeah, we can go to the Mars. The satellites are of great value and private companies do it. But there's no reason for us to land on the moon. There's no reason to land on the moon at this point unless you're a company Maybe, but... who's thinking about making an outpost out there and selling real estate. Yeah, but but, but then it, I mean... it, 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 it begs the question, like, if if that's not really your... I, 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 I do wonder, like, some of the stuff that the government has pushed onto our manufacturers... Is it all? It it doesn't seem to me all invalid. Like uh, I know NASA developed what Teflon, Tang, Tang, and Teflon. <laughs> and I don't t- even think they developed Tang. I think that was like a myth. Maybe the they just whatever, I think man. Tang came out and then just no, don't burst okay. my bubble. All right, right, right keep going. Well, let's forget. But there's these there's these small innovations, and I kind of wonder would would the market have actually delivered that? Because maybe in the long haul, maybe in the long haul, yes, but. Yeah. At the at the time when it was required, mm-hmm. uh, I, would they have done that? There I'd are like some to, things that may have never been invented. Had I would like for to, the government. for sure. But I'd like to speak to World War Two. I uh, for a long, long time, up until a couple of years ago, I had always thought that World War Two was the greatest driver and wars in general because a lot of technology comes out of wars yep and i always thought that world war ii was the greatest driver of innovation and i still kind of believe that but within the last you know two three years since i started reading about intellectual property and how it really stifles development i have come to the the um the belief or whatever that uh, part of that is that we were all trying to, you know, fight a war. We were trying to, you know, steal the bomb or whatever. Or, you know, we, a lot of that technology we got from the atomic technology, we got, you know, we kidnapped scientists, whatever. We, yeah. we took yeah. scientists. Uh, but I think probably more than anything... There was two things. There was an incentive. There was an an incentive to to help whatever we were doing. There was also a, a financial incentive. But the biggest thing was there were no intellectual property rights because if you had a way to make that bomb work better, you weren't going to sit on that idea for two years and wait until you can get a patent on it. You were putting it out there today. You know, you were, the government you were throwing owned. it out there. So the I think the... Possibly the greatest driver of all our technological advances of World War II was that we were stealing, you know, we were stealing technology from Germany, and Germany was stealing it from us, and, you know, the the TV and radar and all that. And it was, 
the lack of intellectual property rights that really drove that no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. What I would argue is that there was a lack of The respect. suspension. No, the suspension well, of intellectual there, property. There is a like, suspension right. of intellectual property when it comes to making war machinery, and it's the reason why any company Only on during Earth, war. Only during even, war. Even now, um, any company on Earth can make an AR-15. Yeah. But it, because there's no intellectual property on an AR-15. Because I've never a, studied this, but it seems to me there was a big jump during, you know, the Civil War, during the World War One, during World War Two, and even yeah. during the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. You know, yeah, there, there's what been you're a describing lot of, is the Gatling gun to the first tanks to the nuclear weapon. Yeah, I mean, this was driven by a desire, mm -hmm. but it was also driven by a suspension of. You know, IP, one of the one of the things that we property. got out of the um, the two Iraq wars and the Afghan war is um, great advances in prosthetics. Yeah, exactly, um, and that's something that you would not sit on during a, a time of great well, need I, as a, a national league. Let's be careful here, because um, during World War Two, the U.S. military had significant manufacturing capability on their own. Outside of Ford and GM, really, they actually had their own manufacturing capability. So there was a little socialist manufacturing. Yes, I didn't and, know that. And, well, right now the only thing socialistically that they still manufacture is bullets for their own weaponry. Um, oh, I didn't know yeah, that. the army it's all actually socialistically. Right well, no, no, the army. They, I thought they bought everything. I didn't know yeah, they were making. No, no, no the either. army. Yeah. As far as like as as far as. Late 90s, early 2000s, uh, still manufactured their own bullets, if I recall really? correctly, hmm. for uh, various types of uh, uh, rifles. That's, that's interesting. Now, um, but if you look at if you look at um, modern technology, where IP is extremely um, carefully monitored and enforced. Uh, Boeing's uh, uh, weaponry, or Boeing's stealth bombers and all that, all that is hidden under IP. And yet, while yeah, there was a demand for security. it, while there was a demand for it, the, I, as far as I can tell, I don't think the government actually knows um, what Boeing does to make that type of stealth. Uh, Wait, which airplane did they... Build Boeing, B Bo the B two, the B two, and, and the F thirty five. Okay. The or the F thirty four, the the new okay. jet that is performing shittily. Okay. Before when you were saying Boeing and weapons, I didn't realize because I was no, thought of the, Boeing's as like the, the cargo plane. F thirty five is F thirty five is uh, Lockheed Martin. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyways, that stealth tech is all IP. Okay. And our government defends that IP. But I don't think our government actually has a strong understanding of what that tech actually is. Huh. And while that technology is theoretically useful, I mean, I don't see a real strong civilian application yeah. for it. But um, I do. What, you're going to stalk your girlfriend? No, he wants to put... <laughs> <laughs> he can use it to escape the state. He has a drone. He has a drone. <laughs> has a drone. <laughs> like, I kind of sit there he like... He does not want to spend the $5 to register his drone. If he could get fucking stealth technology on that drone, he'd say, fuck you. <laughs> but I I'll sit spend there... $3 million to put stealth technology on my drone so I don't have to pay would, that $5. I, I would argue that, to an extent, and, and I don't agree with IP, I don't, but I would argue to an extent that the thing about IP I find interesting is that it, it drives a sense of innovation that is, um, if Microsoft has an operating system, Apple has an operating system, they're both protected by IP. Functionally, they do the same thing. They're distinct it's, in they're their... They're aesthetically different. They're aesthetically different, yeah. and they're different in their strengths. Yeah. And, um, but if Google had an operating system they and they do. just like threw it out there and let people do some, I wonder if there would be like well, more they, than you, one or well, two. Well, you Linux. I if know. I'm, not, I'm just being sarcastic. Yeah, I wonder if there would be more than one. Google has an operating system. They have Google Chrome. You yeah. can buy a laptop with Chrome on it right now. No, but I do I'm wonder. About, uh, I, I do wonder 
if I do wonder, does IP got an operating well, system? Well, if without IP, phones, without IP, uh, internet. That's an internet. No, it's an actual operating system for the laptop. You can buy a Chromebook. I'm sorry. No, it, that, yeah. I do wonder, without IP, um, would there not be a kind of a unification system, like getting all? Um, we can't. We're not protected, so therefore we all have to agree. And that's what I that's what I kind of gather as like a long term um, solution to all these IP issues. If you remove IP, that means all the companies now have to have interoperability. Well, it's like USB. USB is um, universally. It's not owned. I don't think by anyone. No, but it does draw into question then if if everyone accepts it, can there be innovation? Well. Well, I think that there's, um, there's four USBs now. Yeah, but that means that not everyone accepts it. No, I mean they keep revising it and getting better and well, better. Keeps, and I, don't, I don't think I don't everybody know would have exactly to accept how it works, it, but, but there's probably some kind of like committee of technology companies that put it together. So there's a governing body. You know, so I don't think it, it's governing. It might be like Wiki. Well, Wiki is governed by articles that are actually uh, verifiable. Hmm. Well, what about the? The argument for IP that, and I can't disagree with this 100%, but IP is necessary because why would you spend a million or a billion dollars developing something if you did not, were not able to protect that? Well, I agree with you to an extent. I, I look at a Tesla, and I admire Tesla a lot. He developed a lot of interesting uh, products on his own without any type of... He didn't even apply any type of IP law to himself. Uh, he ended up broke and in debt and died, uh, even though he could have made billions off his inventions. I think it was a um, failure on his part to implement his inventions in the form of a business. Well, well... Yeah, but if it you're wasn't a business, an IP he, thing. he it, wasn't a business guy. He was an inventor. That's but no, why no. But let's broke. be careful here. If your if your competitors can manufacture an identical product, how do you? How long do you think your business is going to last? Edison wasn't an well, inventor. Well, look at Bear Aspirin. Was, uh, huh? Bear Aspirin. I, I I don't. Okay, I'll be honest. I don't follow because I'm ignorant on the topic. Okay, so there's Bear AG. That is a German company that makes Bear Aspirin. And there's actually an American bear, too. I don't know which bear you get. You probably get the American bear Who cares? on the shop. But whatever. Go ahead. It doesn't matter. There's a company out there, Bear Aspirin. They make aspirin under the name Bear. Anybody on earth can start an aspirin-making company. Yet this company continues to make Bear Aspirin for like 100 years, and it still sells aspirin at a premium to anyone else who makes aspirin. So it has a reputation. It has a reputation for a quality product. They put the name Bear on it. People trust it, and people pay more for it. So this brings up um, uh, in economics, uh, you have the... You're gonna have, I'm a little intoxicated, Joe. Um, the Walmart Oreos versus actual Oreos. Okay. I forget the... Uh, Hydrox? No, 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 no. Um, Great value? No. I just saw the YouTube primary video today, versus but... secondary um, product. I can't... Um, generic? Generic. Generic versus um, brand. The... Uh, there's another. There's other economic terms for this. Market leader. I actually just saw a, a YouTube video on this. It was a price... Um, Segmentation. Bias, price bias. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't price bias. There's it was it was it was actually people pick this brand because mm -hmm. they have more money at the time to pick this brand. But when they're poor, they'll go for this. Well, other no, there is yeah. price bias. Is um, they did like blind studies where this bottle of wine cost ten dollars and this bottle of wine cost ninety dollars, and it was the exact same wine. But people always chose the ninety dollar wine. Yeah, but there's 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 a specific. Um, Naming for uh, the two, oh, I can't remember. Holy shit! It's from Basic Econ too. Market segmentation. No, it's not market segmentation. It. I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember it. <laughs> We're gonna have to move on. All right, fine. We'll move on. No. Um. So, 
All right. So let me ask you if um, in and in, and Kapistan, do you think trademarks? I hate that name. Yes. Do yeah, you think trademarks? I agree. Would be uh, protected. I agree with you. On or maybe copyright. Say it again. In and Kapistan, do you think trademark or no, copyright could be protected? So you know, I actually think there's a case for trademark. I think you're. Oh, let me let me get yeah. this thing going again. You know, I think. Oh, wait, let me get this thing going. Here. I wonder what IP. Another beer. How um, what do you call that? Uh, how technology is going to affect IP because um, you're able to. Uh, I don't know, I got a mind block. You know, like with Bitcoin crypto, you're at crypto. With cryptography, you are able to protect a lot of information. And I wonder how technology I, I don't think any of us have a we we have a problem with intellectual property, but we don't have a problem with protecting no, you intellectual can make it, property. There's nothing wrong with secrets. Trade secrets is what you're thinking of. You know, you have a secret recipe. There's no reason why you have to oh, share like that Danny with the world. Oh, like Danny was saying that the U.S. government doesn't even know how they make these, uh, you know, stealth fighters. So if you sell a product and you don't tell people what's in it and how it works, is that is that wrong? No, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a trade secret. And, and it's like if you have technology a technology to the... protect your investment like that is there something wrong with that and i no. don't think we would say that either no i'm wrong with that so I, i'm just wondering it might be poor customer service though but i i'm just wondering how technology is going to affect intellectual property in the future well i think a lot of intellectual property is going away because of the open source movement you could open source anything this show is rendered on a linux machine and I'm not a tech guy. I don't know a lot about um, computers. Maybe I'm a little bit more savvy than some people because I'm running a Linux machine. But really, I had um, someone help me out with that. Um, the reason why this show is rendered on a Linux machine is because A, Linux is free, so I didn't have to buy it. Um, and B, on Linux is a whole plethora of open source software that's not available on Linux or, I mean, I'm not available on Windows or Mac or any other operating system, although Kadian Live, the program I use to render this, is available on the Mac, but it's not available on Windows. Um, what happens is people make software for Linux, and if it's a hit, then they will make it for the Mac and the PC. So if you want free software, Linux is the place to go because that's where most of it is, and that's why this show is rendered on a Linux machine. Linux is becoming so, um, it, it's, it's evolving to become such a refined operating system that really anybody can pick it up and use it from the, without ever seeing it before. You, you know, you can pick it up if you want to surf the internet. You, you, you go into your Linux machine, you click on, um, whatever your favorite browser is because they're all there and it looks just like you're browsing in a Windows uh. machine. Um, so the point where I'm getting at this is if they can do it with something as complicated as a computer operating system, there's no reason why you couldn't open source a car. There's no reason why you couldn't open source a drug. Tesla. Um, anything could be open sourced. And I believe that that is the, the, the future of technology because how is Windows going to compete um, forever against um, Linux. I, I, I actually think that eventually Linux will kind of start to ease out Windows unless Windows comes up with a way to give itself away for free. And wow. um, um, that's the only way because the, uh, the price of Linux is free and the price of Windows is $150. At, at some point, that price is going to have to come down as more and more people start moving over to Linux. Tesla tried to do the uh, do do their cars uh, with open source open source I don't know mm -hmm. what happened with that I haven't read nothing about it for you know this is like a year ago but I heard the government was really like messing with them didn't well, want them to do it that, open source. that would have been my point is that you're saying that uh, that Linux has a has has a competitive advantage against Windows yeah. and against other systems because of the way it's set up and stuff like that sure but if the long arm of the government helps out the lesser 
That's possible. They well, could, the, uh, the they, PC, could, they could stack the deck against them. You know, and the it's PC been, and it's happened a, before. Well, I'm sure that happens in cars. Um, it's it's all happened. of the <clears throat> huge amount of regulations yes. in cars, I'm sure, are built. Well, the PC to, is an open source story, you know, because... Yeah, it is, actually. That the PC would have never, you know, come to be if... Uh, you know, it hadn't been open source. Yeah, the PC well, is put together by hundreds of companies. Well, I would argue, uh, Joe, um, we're ignoring the uh, probably the most, the second or if not the largest influential um, contributor to uh, PCing or PC right now. Uh, Apple took Linux, mm -hmm. modified it, standardized it. Okay. And now you can buy Apple operating systems for maybe twenty bucks. And the thing about it is, is that uh, they they don't really. I think the last few updates, honestly, El Captain, I think is the last update. I got that for free. Yeah, I was and able to get that. I got Windows Ten for free. Yeah. Well, let's. How did you get it? I think that was just an upgrade. I think <laughs> no, that was just an upgrade from it, Windows it, it 8. It was an upgrade from Windows 8, but they didn't always give you upgrades. It no, used no, to be $150 I, I, dollars to upgrade your operating become, system. That's become the norm now. No, because that's, you, that's yeah, the competitive they had price. To. For it was a competitive competitive reason for that because Windows 8. If you consider the fact so. that um, people like standardization, we do. Yeah, sure. we really do. It, it's a lot easier to work with the, the, the very the very extreme anarchists, you know, Ubuntu users. Fine. I they got an interesting anecdote. I um, I'm fairly pretty darn computer unsavvy, and I that much uh, as a parent. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to write a letter this morning, right? So you can I got on your computer. Well, I have two computers. I have uh, my uh, desktop, which you helped me set up with Linux, and I had written a letter on there, and I just like, oh, I went to that uh, whatever Libre office thing and clicked on it. Oh, there's a the thing. Okay, I'll write a letter. That's all I wanted to fucking do, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I tried to plug my uh, printer into my my lap my desktop and it's just i couldn't get it to connect linux isn't done doesn't matter that, when, it, it might be the computer's really old and fucked up I'll but anyway just, so i uh you know this happened about a week ago so this time i said well i'll just write it on my uh laptop and a couple of weeks ago i got this free uh, office thing right mm -hmm. it took me a fucking hour to figure out, to just find somewhere where I can just write a fucking letter. Well, you mean maybe 20 office? minutes. I couldn't figure out where is office. I don't know. It's like office, Microsoft office. I don't know. Word. I don't know. I don't even know how I did it. I just like, I just got so frustrated. I just wanted to fucking write a letter. I even Googled it like three or four times. I just wanted to write a fucking letter. How? I mean, with a typewriter, you could just go boop, boop. Well, that's, well, you have to have software to write a letter on. I have it. With, I just couldn't find it. Yeah, it's so like, you have to find it. But, if but you I'm just buy, saying on my my it, Linux, it's it's just an anecdote and makes me look stupid. You're able to stupid. write the letter immediately on, on Linux, Linux. Boom. It so took me... But the printer was giving you a hard time. Yeah, but, but then when I went to do it on Windows 10, I couldn't find figure out how to write a letter because I just... Well, Windows I 10 does Googled not it. come with letter writing software. Well, no, you have to I, I downloaded it Office for free for a month or something, oh, okay. but I couldn't figure out how to open Office. I'm just like, you know, I got like 100 programs on there, and I finally, after a few tries, I started reading, and of course, they have to start it with a W. I think it was Word or something. I finally found it. You know, it's like, oh. I almost called you. Word or, is, uh, word is, I almost yeah. called it's you. Word. Word. It's usually, word. I didn't want to sound word. stupid, but it's I've been drinking. And it's usually I'm going to tell everybody how stupid I am now. It's usually in a folder, like soft office, you have to find that and then whatever. But okay. Add along I mean, on Windows, Windows 10, you. there's no folders. There's no. apps and all that stupid yeah. shit. But this is the thing as I, I'm alluding to is that if you're not, if you're not familiar with uh, this standard, I mean, people like standards. There's a reason why, Joe, that you can drive around in your car and all four of your tires are more or less the same, right? There's standardization. It's easy to work with. You can pull off one tire from the rear and put it on the front, and there's this 
effectively the no, same time. No, you so should not do that. You, there, should, it, you can re- rotate the fronts and the rears, but you shouldn't never put a front All right, stop. rear. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm alluding to. Know, so we're here speaking English, and we have no trouble understanding each other. Right. Lang- languages, I mean, there's, there's, it's not perfect. You're right. Languages emerge naturally and without a central governing body. A lot of times central governing bodies get involved with languages, like well, I, with Spanish. But languages without a central governing body still become standardized very organically. And I think that can happen within the open source movement. I think it has happened in, in, in some areas. Well, if you look at, but okay, if you look at original Windows. Yeah. Original, uh, Apple software mm-hmm. and original uh, Linux or any other operating systems. There was a bunch of operating systems that all came online generally around the same time, and the one that, um, and I'm not saying that it was particularly honest or ethical, but the one that came online was the one that was uh, most practical to use. And what I mean by that is that. Uh, initially Apple came online, everyone loved Apple, and then it became a micro, uh, then Microsoft came online because Microsoft was cheaper and it was efficient and it was business like. And it was easy to pirate. It, not only was it easy to pirate, but you could install it on any machine. Yeah. Now, yeah. And Apple had all these restrictions. I would argue, if you really look at it from a long, or from a higher, from a higher level, all these systems were, um, thanks, Joe. Uh, Just get it by the microphone so it makes all kinds of noise. <laughs> I would argue that all these systems were, in a technical sense, organic. Um, there was no governing body for operating systems at the time. Right. Uh, it's only that after a few of them emerged as dominant, and then there became standardization b- between, uh, I would argue, the main three. And even then, that standardization, I would argue, is a sense of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say government, but it's a governing body. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why I can plug in my phone from a Linux. Yeah. So basically, a- open source encourages standardization. Because, yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's much but more the thing organic. Linux is that... But it's voluntary. That's the difference. Well... People who pick a Microsoft product versus an Apple product versus a Linux product are making a voluntary decision. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So, my contention with Linux, and I, I like Linux, I played with it. Um, there's Linux still seems to be kind of stuck in this phase of um, what you can have like fifty two flavors of it. Yeah, the, there's so many variability that. And the, the Linux within itself, there's not a lot of standardization. The big names have standardization. Ubuntu, um, Mint, Mint. Um, there's one that starts with a G. I can't remember the name of it. There's a few big names within the, the Linux community. I have Mint, by the way. But um, until there is an actual, I would argue, until there's an actual dominant a, a super dominant um, Linux. Mm-hmm. Linux won't. Um, mm-hmm. it, it won't. I disagree. Mm. I think you need a, 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 a market leader needs to emerge. I, yeah, I, I, I can, I can, I can see where you're coming from with that. And um, yeah. also need as long as it's intuitive. Yeah, and that's, that's the nice right. thing about phones nowadays. You can, you know. Yeah, we all use different operating systems on our phones. Yeah, but as long as there's only three different. operating systems, and, and there's, there's multiple. Two- di- and then Android has multiple different skins, which is kind of <laughs> like Linux. If you buy a Samsung phone, if you if you're used to using an HTC phone, you buy a Samsung phone, you might not know what to do with it right away. But why is but Android it, so dominant? Because it's open source. Yeah, or? Android is Linux. Is it really? I didn't well, know. the reason why yeah. it's dominant, I would argue, is because it's generally cheaper. Google why offers it? it 
cheaper be, and they have a, a billion well, literally probably a billion apps. and anybody yeah. can develop a phone and throw android on it not anybody can develop a phone and put whatever the ios is on it right and the same so, thing with microsoft yeah but the thing about it is that um well android's well, free too it's it's well not- android is free and it's popular and don't get me wrong uh i don't see samsung or google or um Whoever else makes Android phone ad, Android phones dominating the cell phone cell phone market as much as Apple is. I like, think in terms more, of profitability. I don't know. I bet there's more profit in Android phones collectively than collectively in, than in Apple phones. But there's no emergent here, guys. power or market uh, winner, if you will. What, what, well, how are we getting off track? I don't know. Maybe we should wrap it up. We are like an hour and a half into this show. I had one question though. I wanted to this ask you, a Dave. Good show, yeah, it is oh, a good show. Is. Dave, um, can I ask Dave a question? First? All right, let's let's yeah, ask we'll Dave let you a question. Ask question. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we will allow you to well, ask. Well, we question. have been uh, over talking, Dave. But anyway, um, um, what happened? Uh, if you don't mind me asking, uh, I'm guessing that you probably went to. College. I'm just wondering uh, what happened with you in the uh, Vietnam War. Your number didn't come up, or you went to school, or is that okay of a question to ask you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not an okay question. We no, can it's cut not this a, out. I, I could, you can answer the question, but it's uh, it's it's complicated. I was uh, originally uh, I, I was going to community college in nineteen in nineteen seventy. And I had the uh, the two S classification, and then in the second semester I was in school. I lost that. What is the two S classification? Is it, is it going to college? Oh, okay. Versus the one A, versus the other. What is one A? One A is eligible to be drafted. Okay. And then there's uh, you know four F is your you're not uh, you're not you're fucked. You're, fucked. Yeah, you're fucked. You're, the, the, you got problems. And you're not allowed to. <laughs> You know, you don't you don't get drafted. But I, I had originally had a two S classification, and then I lost the, the deferment, and I became one A. Mm. And when I was one A, I was, you know, in the in the lottery, and in the lottery, I you know, I was I was number one twenty seven, and uh, my draft board didn't get to one twenty seven wow, in the nineteen seventy one draft, and then I was given the, I think it was a two H or H one. It's like H is a you're given that classification after the draft lottery is comes through. So, so this is over like 45 years later, and you remember yeah. all these oh, yeah. arcane well, I details. I, <laughs> yeah. up. I still have my draft card. Scary I still shit. have my draft card in my pocket. I don't and, know. Uh, you know, um, I was given that in your pocket. Yes, I I, I just happened to have it for. A, or something. Maybe we we'll get a picture it? of it. But, well, uh, we don't want to show but, uh, personal information. Oh, it's if personal it doesn't yeah. But I would like to see it personally. Oh, okay. But I was, uh, I, uh, I, I had the three classifications, and I wasn't drafted, and I didn't have to go to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Is that would what you, you have gone done? to Canada? I don't, I don't know. You don't, you don't, you don't know until speculate. it happens. That's exactly. You don't right. know what you're not. Yeah. Gonna, you don't know exactly what you're going to do. <laughs> That's like people who say, "Well, against. I would never do that." I don't. Yeah. You don't know. You, what you don't know do. until you're. But you were drafted. you were philosophically against um, being forced to, to to go to war. I didn't want to be drafted. Yeah, I didn't enlist. And I, you know, I, I took part in a couple. Well, of some people war. enlisted in the Air Force to prevent being drafted sure. into the Army. All right, so let's wrap up the show. Before we go, I just wanted to say that. Um, you know, people are coming to the show from Stitcher. They're coming from YouTube. They're coming from freedomtalkmedia.com. And uh, they might be picking up our links from Facebook. Um, Grand radio waves in outer space. Yeah, they might be out there somewhere. No more um, arms. We, we have show notes at, at freedomtalkmedia.com. I usually put the link on the uh, the YouTube page. Um However you come to the show, any of anytime we mention someone else's work, I usually put um, a link in the show notes. And then if we have a guest on the show who's got some kind of um, blog or anything like that, 
We'll throw a link in there as well. <laughs> so make sure you get over to freedomtalkmedia.com to... Um, we didn't give any shout-outs today at all. We, we get Actually, some shout-outs. There will be some show notes for this episode. Who did we give a well, shout-out no, no, to? Uh, Milton Friedman, uh, free to choose. Well, let me throw out my own shout-out. Uh, uh, I just want to say thanks, uh, Dane and Hannah McCoy. Uh, Dane Cook? No, we Dane, don't, I don't know, I even know how to say it. Waylon? Yeah, Dane Waylon and Hannah McCoy. Um, I look forward to the anarchist flag and your anarchist... Yeah, um, we don't have any of their gear with us this time. Well, oh, no, we don't. But, over, yeah, I left it. Uh, but in either case, I, um, without a ruler, I support you guys. Yeah, All right. Over Thanks. here. Okay. What? Thanks for... Uh, Getting this side of the camera today, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cameraman Dave comes around to be on the show. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Okay. <laughs> roundup? Is that what we're doing? Yeah. Why are we doing a roundup? Okay. Yeah. That's good, then. Excellent. <laughs>